All right, if you have a Bible tonight, let's turn to Job and get Job chapter 5. Job chapter 5. We'll talk a while about verse 7. Job chapter 5, verse 7. My subject tonight is trouble in the Christian. Trouble in the Christian. On Job chapter 5, verse 7, Job uh, says something very profound there, and a lot of things said profound in the book of Job. book of Job has some great statements in it. And that passed there in the book of Job chapter 5, verse 7, he asks a question, or makes a statement, he makes a statement about man, and he says about man, one of the things about man is man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. The idea is when you light a fire, and if you've ever lit a fire, lit a fire you know what goes on, you light a fire, the sparks go up the chimney, and the smoke goes up the chimney. That is a natural thing for it to do. The most natural thing in the world is for the sparks to fly upward. And man is born to trouble just like that. When man comes in, when man is born, when you're born, you come into a, a conflagration that's taking you up the chimney just like that. You just rise with it, boy. I mean, smoke and, and, and sparks and, and embers and stuff. Man is born into trouble as the sparks fly up, but a great truth. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, when he built the wall of Babylon, they said that every every brick in the wall of Babylon had the letter N in it. He was a nice, uh, nice, humble fellow. And so all those bricks in that wall of Babylon, the several million, had the, his initial inscribed on the on the brick, N, you know, a living, living stone, you know. Well, I would tell you, if there was ever a, a letter that should, could be inscribed on a Christian, uh, to show he's a living stone and part of the household of God, he'd be the letter T. That's the letter. Christ said, while you're in the world, you'll have tribulation. So he'd be of good strength, overcome the world. Uh, when you ever meet a man, if you ever meet a man over, oh, uh, 18 years old, has never had any trouble, I want to meet him. I want to meet him. I want to meet one human being over 15 that's never had any trouble. I never met one in my life. And if you're saved, you're going to have problems. Uh, people think, well, when I get saved, all my problems are going to be ended. No, many times your problems are just starting when you get saved. And I'm going to talk about some of those problems. Now, first of all, when I talk about trouble, when I talk about trouble, I'm going to talk about difficulties, disappointments, problems, sorrows, pain, fear, these things that come up and hit us. And the first of these are simply problems. What are problems for? Problems are given to make us think. <laughs> You see these signs around, think, think, think. Folks are stupid, you have to remind them of it. And think, you know, think. One time I thought I'd throw a little boy out in the ice floe up there in some state up, new, uh, up north in the winter. A little boy had a brand new pair of skates. And he'd gone out there and he'd, uh, I don't mind my suits out of press, I've been, I've been walking out there in the rain. And some folks, they worry more about the press in your suit now than the message. Honest to God, Christian. I got a letter from well one time on television, he said, how come you never have a decent haircut? <laughs> and he said, you're wearing these uh, jackets with pants that don't match, you know. And you're wrong on this, not right back. I said, listen, I don't know who you are, but anybody's worried about what a man wears on television, there's something wrong with his jeans. <laughs> and he never wrote back. <laughs> Now, you run through a little rainstorm like that. That was a little sprinkle out there. Now, if you want to know what it's like in the Philippines in the rainy season, it's like that every other day for three months. The world record rainfall of the Philippine Islands is 48 inches in one day. 48 inches in one day. It's wet. <laughs> well, you have problems what for to make you think. And he got that little boy out there, was one of those skates, going down those skates, and he kept falling down, he'd get up and fall down, and get up and fall down. And that man watched him for about 30 minutes. He must have fallen down eight times in 30 minutes. And finally the man said, uh, why don't you quit, son? Why don't you quit? And that boy got up with tears in his eyes. A little kid about, you know, about 11 years old said, I didn't buy these skates to quit. I buy them to learn how to skate. <clears throat> That's it. That's it. You'll have problems to make you think. Make your thing. Work a thing out. Do some work at it. You're going to have problems with your budget. Don't you something have budget problems? Don't you have problems with discipline your children? Your trouble is you say, well, if I could just choose my problem, no, God choose our problems for us. If you could choose your problem, it wouldn't be a problem. If you could choose your problem, you'd choose something you could solve. <laughs> but God's always putting across something you can't solve. You say, what for? To make you think. Uh, there's a great song we don't... Uh, we don't sing, we ought to sing it called The Cross Was His Own. 
and he borrowed a, you know, a bed to lay his head, you know, and Christ the Lord came down, all of those things about his life where he borrowed this and borrowed that, and then the, and the chorus says, but the cross was his own, the cross was his own. And every child of God has a cross somewhere in his life given to him, that's his own doing, and it, it'll, it'll change. Maybe your problem is you got a snappy husband. Maybe you got all these husbands just have this here and that there and this here and that right there, not an inch off here. If it's over here, it's wrong. If it's over here, it's wrong. And yip, 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 yip. Some of you ladies got a husband like that. <laughs> Let me hear an amen, ladies. <laughs> you could identify yourself sitting right next to him. <laughs> and then some of you got a griping wife. <laughs> Complaining about this, complaining about that. The water is where it should be. The door should be open. The door should, should be shut. The window should be open. The window should be shut. All the covers on one side of the bed, you know. <laughs> the radio should be off here. Now. Oh, yeah, man. Oh, yeah. I mean, one of the greatest things you discover in your marriage is that you married a person instead of a, a, a male or a female. <laughs> and one of those things, those are problems got to make you think. That's why God gave them to you. God sent your problems to make you think. Uh, if, if you ever have these, uh, a, a griping partner where nothing pleases, you know, you come home and say, praise the Lord, man, 15 people got saved. Oh, well, good. <laughs> you know, off day with $2,000. Isn't that nice? <laughs> now, listen, when God puts like something that across your, way across your path, a problem like that, it's a problem to be solved. And if you can't solve it, it's to make you think about it. I mean, uh, one fellow said they that study philosophy rightly studied nothing but death. What he meant with that is death's a problem. You've got to think about it. Whether you want to, you've got to think about dying. If you don't want to think about dying, it's a problem. Problems sent to make you think, oh, up next, difficulties are sent. Difficulties are sent. Now, what are difficulties sent for? Difficulties are sent to make you pray. I mean, God, you have a difficulty come in your life that it isn't just a problem. I mean, it's a thing you can't get out of, nothing you can do about it. And, uh, and, and all you can do is pray about it, and that's why, why the Lord sent it. The uh, Bible says over there in, uh, in Ephesians, the church, take the shield of faith. And with the shield of faith, he says, you're going to be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And where those darts are going to come at you, it's yeah, difficulties. And difficulties will make you pray. Broken down washing machines, ladies. Students going to school, broken down cars. Every time you get the wreck fixed, it breaks down again. Difficulties. I met our boys uh, uh, walking to school in the rain. I met our boys riding bicycles to school in the rain. We had a fellow one time here who used to work down uh, down there near Cordova Mall someplace. When he come to school, he walked the whole distance from Cordova Mall. I picked him up walking in the rain coming across there. Those are difficulties. Those things that make you pray. Busted down machines. Things around the house. Of uh, finding things. Finding things. I look. I look for the longest to find something I can't find. But before I think about praying for it, when it gets impossible, that's all you can do. You got to pray for it. Of course, should have. That should have been the first resort, you know. But sometimes you don't think about it. You know, have to look for an hour. You keep telling yourself, "Well, it's bound to be around here somewhere." <laughs> That's to make you pray. Now, you take a, a fellow up there, a fellow named John here, and he was 31 years old. He was taking care of a night desk at Holiday Inn in Memphis here about five or six years ago, well, about eight years ago now. And John here was up there taking care of that desk, and the fellow came in, a robber came in, put a gun on him, put a pistol right in his head. And said, get up, open the cash, register there, and give me the money. And John here was reading his Bible when the guy came in. And John Hare looked up at him and said, go on and shoot, I don't care. So I'm saved and I live a good life, I'm ready to go to heaven. So go on and shoot. <laughs> the guy didn't know what to do. He stood there with a pistol and John Hare bowed his head and prayed. Him. And said, God, please take this poor demon, this young man to save his soul from the devil hell. And I love this young man, I'd like to see him saved. I don't want to have him go to hell for God's sake, save him. That guy was standing there, <laughs> shaking with a pistol, sweat off his face, and he'd be able to say, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? <laughs> and old, old John here got through praying, and he said, you're going to get saved, that's what you're going to do. And the guy put out his gun and sat down and saved him, led him to Christ. 
and took his shell out of his gun, gave the shells and paid them off for a Bible, walked out the door with a Gideon Bible. <laughs> Now, you know, old John, you know what John Hare was up against? He was up against a difficulty. <laughs> you know what he did? He prayed. He prayed. Difficulty and problems. Back here, somebody's trying to prevent this Christian soldier from uh, attacking a certain place or reaching a certain objective. They put a wall of fire around him here. So he can't get up off of this opposite bank and meet him way down from some muck here into the stream through here, knee deep in water to obtain his objective. And the idea here is the Christian beset with trouble. And laws of this world, is you're going to have tribulation. And Christ said, be good cheer, I've overcome the world. Up there in Newfoundland, way back around 1870, the fishing fleet went out one time. And when they started back, a tremendous fog came in. The whole fleet was lost at sea. Three fishing ships, about 15 of them. And there were mothers and sweethearts and rallies and going up down the shore and wringing their hands and praying, you know. And, and there wasn't any way they could see the lighthouse, the way entrance to the harbor. They lost the way they entered the harbor. Nobody could tell where they were going or what they were doing. And the, there were families up there crying and weeping and wailing and praying on that shoreline. And to make matters worse, in the middle of that dense fog, a cottage up there on the shore of Newfoundland caught on fire and burned to the ground. Nothing was burning the ground. One woman, the woman there whose cottage it was, was talking to her husband down on the beach and complaining and wringing her hands and saying, Oh, God, how could he do this? How could God do this thing to us with all the trouble we've got like that? With all the sun out here at sea, how could God do a thing like that? And boy, about an hour later, the whole fleet just came right through the fog and came into the harbor. And they said, I said, How'd you do it? They said, Four of our ships saw your light up on the shore, and four of our ships headed for the light. We followed the four ships, and the whole fleet came in. What was the light? A cottage burned to the ground. Now that difficulty was sent to make people pray. And they were praying. When they prayed, up go the cottage and cottage and flame of the salvation of the scores. Difficulties are sent to you and make you pray. That isn't all. That isn't all criticism. What's criticism for? God will send you criticism to make you examine yourself. And you sometimes you get kind of a false idea about yourself. And sometimes it takes criticism to make the thing come out. A good rule you ought to remember about yourself is don't ever believe everything bad everybody says about you. Don't ever believe it. And by the same token, don't believe everything good everybody says about you. You want to get a balance. You want to get a balance there. Paul, the greatest Christian that ever lived, says, In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. So he wasn't any, he wasn't stuck on himself. He knew himself. But the same token, he said, uh, uh, the Lord made me an apostle to Gentiles, I magnify my office. And he said, and, and, and made the Gentiles obedient in word and deed, uh, not I, but the grace of God that worked in me. He understood the thing. But people are going to criticize you, and they're going to find fault with you. And uh, if, if, you, if you're going to quit every time you hear criticism, you might as well just quit at the start and never do anything. Because that's one of the things that comes to everybody. It's a strange thing how God's people seem to faint at stuff that unsaved people can get through. Uh, boy, do you realize what it takes to be president of the United States or mayor or governor, the, the mud you have thrown at you these days? Do you realize what Barry Goldwater and some of those fellows went through to try to get into office? And, uh, and, and George Wallace and some of those fellows? And Jesse Helms? Why, Jesse Helms, every faggot and every Frisco fairy fruit from here to New York and to Frisco was trying to control the elections in North Carolina. Really? Really? All the newspapers, all the, the bunch of sex perverts demonstrating in San Francisco about North Carolina. What business there is what's going on in North Carolina? Well, they're criticizing the old boy. You know what they call Jesse Helms in Congress? They call him Attila the Hun. <laughs> and they call him Attila the Hun because he just takes a straight line and just plows through. Now, if you can't take criticism, then you better get ready, better, you better get ready to be a dropout. Because if you can't take criticism, you can't take anything. You know what Paul said one time? Paul said, uh, he said, you take that shield of faith wherewith you, wherewith you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Those fiery darts were, that was napalm. Napalm, that was the, that was the original thing, part of it. It was a, an arrow, and it had cotton tied on it right there. And then with the cotton tied it right there, that guy would fire that thing, and that thing would come at you like that. And that thing was a flaming arrow, what that thing was. He said, wherever you should be able to, to, to quench all the fiery darts, the wicked one. It's done to make you examine yourself. 
I mean, uh, did you ever see how those Pharisees lit into Jesus Christ? Boy, they went after him like a pack of rabid dogs. Found fault with him, he didn't wash his hands before he sat down to eat. How come this man breaks the Sabbath? What's this fellow doing to say he forgives sin? He can, oh, God only forgives sins, blast me, blast me. He casts out uh, devils by the prince of devils. He builds them up. If Jesus Christ didn't escape it, my God, people, how can you escape? We got a whole nation of thin-skinned sissies, and most most of them are Christian these days. And they're sitting there, they're sitting there even preaching like pine. They get upset because you take it personally. I hope you do take it personally. The personal, the better. Well, I just don't like people talking about that way. Then get, go back in the crib and suck your bottle and suck your thumb and quit trying to put on a show, okay? Get out of the traffic before you get killed. If you can't take something like that, you can't take what's out there. They're going to get on you. They're going to eat you alive. And the, person, the pur purpose of that is to make you examine yourself, to make you careful. It makes you give, give you an accurate estimate of what you actually are. Uh, you're going to have to go through something, and there's no way to get around it. How many brush strokes does it take to paint a picture? I don't know. Right back there in that bathroom, there's one back there, and that thing's about 12 feet high and about uh, 9 feet wide. I just finished a painting downtown 8 by 16. And I'd say uh, conservatively on that thing, uh, conservatively, I'd say uh, 400,000 conservatively. Two, three, four. 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. Right, wrong color, paint it. 24, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34, 36, about 400,000. I don't know how much it takes to make a sculptor. I'm no kind of a sculptor. I never sculpt nothing. I couldn't sculpt anything. But uh, I, I'll bet you and a fellow sculptors, I bet he doesn't get that thing done. A, a statue, you know, eight or nine feet high, I bet he get, doesn't get it done without hitting that thing about uh, 40,000 times and chipping away at that thing. That's what criticism is for. Criticism will, will make you into something. Thou is you're not going to be baiting anything. The tree that never had to fight for sun and sky and air and light, that stood out in the open air and always got its share of rain, never became a forest king, but lived and died a scrubby thing. The man who never had to toil the heaven for the common soil, who never had to win his share of sun and sky and light and air, never became a manly man but lived and died as he began. Good timber does not grow in ease. The stronger the wind, the tougher the trees. The farther the sky, the greater the length. The more the storm, the more the strength. By snow and sun, by rain and cold, and good tree or man, good timber grows. Where thickest stand the forest growth, we find the patriarchs of both. And they hold converse for the stars, whose broken branches show the scars of many winds and much strife. This is the common law of life. I wish it wasn't, but that's what it is. What's the criticism for? It's to make you examine yourself, do something to yourself. Now that isn't all. Disappointments. Disappointments. You're not going to reach all of your goals. You're not going to attain all your goals. All, all the things that, thing that you wanted to do and, and planned to do and hoped to do are not all going to come out. A man said one time, he said, disappointments, our disappointments are God's appointments. I guess that's what you spell that thing. Something like that. <laughs> disappointments are God appointments. And you, you know, your children are not all going to come out like you want them to come out. You've been disappointed in your kids. You had high hope for your children. They didn't turn out the way you wanted them to turn out. They disappointed you. Children can be a great disappointment. And as far as that goes, parents can be a great disappointment. As far as that goes, a lot of things can be disappointments. All kinds of things go wrong. Is your place a small place? Tend it with care. He set you there. Is your place a large place? Guard it with care. He put you there. Whatever your place is, not yours alone, but he who placed you there. That's the business. I mean, don't 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 labor to be rich and labor for all these big goals because a lot of them are gonna fall to pieces on you. Take it one day at a time, one step at a time. That fellow Epstein, who was the manager of the manager of the Beatles, well what a title, manager of the Beatles. Manager of the cockroaches, you know, or bugs or something. He's a manager of the Beatles. We used to step on Beatles, what we did. 
and that fellow, he died when he was 32 years old. He left behind him $2 million by the time they got through that estate in 1967. They had $200,000 left after the lawyers and doctors got through the other stuff. Oh boy, this died, went to the devil hell now then, a stupid fool. I mean, busting his neck to make a million dollars. He made a million dollars and died and go to hell and the Lord got what you left. A disappointment. Didn't work out the way he wanted it to work out. Worst disappointment in this world would be winding up in hell after making a trip going through life like that. Some Christians, uh, instead of singing, land me safe on Canaan shore, they're singing, land my safe on Canaan shore. <laughs> and it's <laughs> no use to work yourself a death and thing like that. You may not make it. You may not make it. Quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Disappointment is his appointment. One time over in Georgia, a pastor over there had a fellow in his church, a fine fellow, a, a, a peach grower, had one of those big uh, peach orchards like they have over in Georgia. And boy, one uh, winter, uh, uh, a frost came in there and killed his whole crop on a couple of hundred acres of peaches. And after that, that fellow didn't come back to church for about four months. And the pastor went by to see him. The pastor said to him, he said, uh, how come you quit coming to church? He said, uh, well, I quit coming, I'm not going to be coming back. He said, why not? He said, I cannot worship the God that will do to my peaches what God did to my peaches. <laughs> he said, why, God can call the weather, and why'd he tear up my peach crop like that and destroy my peach crop? And what that preacher told him, he said, God isn't interested in peaches, he's interested in men. And God is interested in growing peaches. God loves you more than he loves peaches. He cares more about you than he does about uh, peaches. And God's interested in growing men, not, not peaches. And one of the ways you grow men is you criticize them. You persecute them. You find fault with them. That's one of the ways you do it. And then you have sorrows. Sorrows. What are sorrows for? Well, sorrows are to make us feel for others. Paul said one time, we're, we're, we're in all this trouble that we get under. We're comforted by God, by that comfort wherewith we ourselves are comfort of God, and he said that we might uh, comfort those that are in any, any kind of trouble. Uh, you're going to go through sorrows in life so you can sympathize with those who uh, have sorrows. Uh, nothing worse than a Christian who's never had any real sorrow in his life. He can't be sympathetic. Something goes wrong with another Christian and he criticizes for it, you know. Well, they shouldn't behave that way, but a little, a little thing like that. Well, maybe it is a little thing, but maybe it's a big thing to them. Maybe some of you haven't been through yourself, so you wouldn't be able to judge whether the thing is a little or not. I mean, children are like that. We call them crybabies. The little boy girl always crying, something going wrong, you know. The little baby about a year, two years old, they're bawling, hollering all the time about something, you know. A lot of time it isn't anything. But it's big to them. It's big to them, you know. A little kid uh, catches his finger in the door, you know, and turns kind of pink, you know. He's all upset about it, you know. And, Daddy says, oh, shut up, you ain't hurt. <laughs> you know, that's kind of like an iceberg criticizing a rose petal for having a drop of dew in its eye, you know. It's a, one of them things. An old tramp was out there one time. He was uh, trying to get some little bit of work, pick up some food and stuff. He stopped at the lady's house, and he said, uh, knocked the door. She came to the door, and he said, uh, I'm collecting bottles. You got any beer bottles? And she said, do I look like the kind of a woman that drink beer? And he said, no, excuse me, man, you got any vinegar bottles? <laughs> <laughs> they get them like that. They get them like that. I mean, the sorrows there are to, are, are to make you sympathize with others. The Bible says, like as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities them and fear him. You have, ought to have pity other people to have trouble. I remember one time when Dave was up, at, I was going to school for Bob Jones. We lived in a trailer at that time, and... I told David to do something he, he didn't do. I trying to rake the leaves. He didn't get the donor done or something, you know, and I and I was going to whip him for it. And about the time I got ready to whip him, began to cry. And I said, well, why don't you rake the leaves, son? He, he said, Daddy, I didn't have enough energy to wake the weaves. <laughs> I couldn't hit him after that. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I didn't have enough energy to, to wake the weaves. <laughs> I mean, the Lord knows all about these things. The Bible said we don't have a high priest that cannot be touched with the fittings of our infirmities, but was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Uh, Jesus Christ knows what it's like to lay up in the roof in 105 degrees. 
You know, it's like to have to stir the mud and come home with your back aching and can't hardly straighten up men over there. All those little things be like that. I mean, people don't think about those things. We've had guys come down here and never did a real lick of hard work a day in their life. And they got down here and had to pick up two dollars an hour, three dollars an hour, taking a wheelbarrow full of mud and take it over to Mason, you know, and run them back and forth there. The kid come in the first night, be blisters all over his hands, and ought to be crying. A kid 20 years old. <laughs> Now, some of you tough old nuts, you know, they go, oh, well, you know, I'd say nothing, though. Know. Here's to him. Here's to him. He never went through that before. Lord knows all about that. Bible said we don't have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. We have a high priest. We have a high priest that knows all about this, and our high priest is sympathetic. Sympathetic. And as sure as you live and breathe, God Almighty will take you and it puts you through it and bring the sorrows into your life to make you sympathetic. And another fiery dart's going to come your way. And we call this uh, fiery dart, we call this one here pain. We call this one here pain. Now what's pain for? Pain is to make heaven more real to you. Heaven isn't real enough to a lot of Christians. I know a lot of Christians. I go up and down this country all year round, preach, you know that, and I preach, preach to all kinds of congregations. And you know what's wrong with most congregations in America today? They have no sense of the afterlife. They have no sense of heaven. They have no sense of hell. They're secular. They're secular. They're all sitting there either waiting to get offended or sitting there have you, have you make them feel good. That's right. They expect when they come in, your job is to make them feel good. Or else your job is to offend them so they can go out the door and bellyache about something. What's that got to do with eternity? Amen. Amen. I've had a lot of time thinking about these things. I've come to a conclusion. And I don't reach it overnight. But I've come to a conclusion. The main job of a preacher is not even tell folks uh, how to behave. God can show you that. I mean, you can find out. If you want to know what things are right or wrong, you don't have to come to me about it. If you want to know about things being right or wrong morally, well, you've got to go and get in the closet and we'll straighten you out real quick on it. You say, what are preachers for? I know what preachers are for. I know why God called preachers. God called preachers to remind people over and over again that this life here is not all there is to it and make you think about eternity when you don't want to think about eternity. Yeah. That's what it's for. Just keep jabbing with it. But as you preachers, you're talking about pie in the sky by and by. Yes, sir, baby. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You bet your booties. You ain't going to get it here. <laughs> The dessert comes at the end of the meal and not here. And that's what the preacher's job is for, is to remind you of that, remind you of that, remind you of that. And preachers in America, they are not doing that. They've got this family-oriented stuff with this, talking about uh, how to let your wife run the family so it doesn't break up and that kind of stuff. And all people are sitting around, you know, spreading a great uh, sauce or pudding to pour over their souls and give them comfort so they can rest comfortably. That is what the ministry is about. It's not about that. Now you take pain, pain will come to you. What for? Well, it'll come to you to make you homesick for heaven. I had a fellow, a friend of mine, died here a couple of weeks back. His name was Blue Denham. Oh, that wasn't his real name. His first name was Carl. It was Carl Denham was his name. We call him Blue Denham. He's about six feet uh, five, big old rough, raw, bony, hillbilly, redneck type of fella. They call him in the bars. They call him the Kansas City Kid. I don't know why they call him that. <laughs> They call him a kid, wasn't no more near, even if it went within 500 miles of Kansas City. But they call him the Kansas City kid. And when he get in the fight in these bars, he had one move he always made. He had about six feet, or maybe about six feet three, I guess he was, and must have weighed about, oh, about uh, 190 pounds, just getting into the rail. And the one move he always made was he'd come up with that big old long foot and kick, and he could kick seven feet in the air. And he'd do a lot of, get a lot of trouble with the police that way. <laughs> but he died, and I remember right before he died, his daddy died. And uh, I was around the hospital when he was, talked to his daddy before his daddy died, and his daddy was lying there in the bed, he was saved, and his daddy was praying, and his daddy said, Oh, Lord, please take me home. Please take me home. Oh, God, I want to go home. I've suffered so much. I wish you'd please take me home. Pain. What for? Make you, make you conscious of something else, boy. Ain't all down here. It's up there. God will do that to you. Now let that thing happen to you. When we cease to bleed, we cease to bless. One of the great writers of uh, poems was a, a dear old saint named, uh, I think her name was Nicholson, something like that. I collect her poems. I guess she's been dead now for years, but she wrote this one time. 
Christ of the sick room, bending low, touching the fevered, aching brow, smoothing the lines of care away, easing the pain of a long, long day, whispering hope and faith and cheer, Christ of the sick room, tender and dear, knowing that sometimes I cry aloud my pain, it is not I, but the tortured flesh that is crying out, knowing too that it is not, no doubt, when I call to him, where are you, Lord? Then he comes with his blessed word, lo, I am here, not afraid, every pang is measured and weighed, not a feather's weight more is given to thee, and thou shalt have strength to bear through me, Christ of the hospital, when at last the pain of my broken body is past, and I see him crowned in glory and power, can my heart forget one sacred hour? Perhaps I shall think as I kneel at his feet, is this kingly one really any more sweet than the tender Christ I came to know? Christ of my sick bed down below. That lady was a chronic invalid for 45 years. 45 years. And she said, when I get home to glory, she said, when I get home to glory and meet Jesus Christ the King, will I think that he's any better than the one that took care of me when I was down there in that bed? Now listen, that woman wasn't family-oriented. She was heaven-oriented. <laughs> Set your affections on things above and not on things on things. <laughs> Boy, if modern girls don't have a time of that, you go down this country, you talk about heaven, talk about glory, and they sit there and blink at you like a tree full of owls. Something's wrong. Uh, it, it isn't all down here. You say, where are you going to be? Whatever you're going to be, wind up in glory. Wind up with God. Wind up with Christ. One time a family wanted to sign up their boy would be, so they, he got to be about 15 years old, and they knew pretty soon he'd probably decide to make a big decision of what he wanted to be in a lifetime, so they decided to set a trap for him to see what he's going to be. And they put a, in a room, they put a wine bottle, a bottle and a Bible and a $20 bill and a pistol in a room where he could get a hold of them. And they went back there and looked through a crack in a little opening there to see what he'd do when he came in there. And he came there and looked at those things. And they said, if he picks up the wine bottle, he's going to be a bootlegger or a drunk. If he picks up the dollar bill, he's going to be a, a banker. If he picks up the pistol, he's going to be a gangster. So he picks the Bible, he's going to be a minister. And they said, uh, one of them said, if he picks the money, he's going to be a politician. And the boy came there and took a look at those, that $20 bill and the wine bottle and the Bible and the pistol picked up all four of them. And the mother said, isn't that wonderful? He's going to be a pope. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, yeah, brother. Now, you know what God, God will do? He'll send you another kind of trouble. We call this trouble here, we call this trouble simply, here we call this one fear. What does God send fear for? God sends fear to keep you from sin. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of the Lord depart from evil. One of the things God does will send you fear, make you scared at times, and do that to keep you from sinning, from doing wrong. I got a case back there where a fellow was in a penitentiary for about five years, and he did his time and got out. He was a savvy fella. And he got saved, he got in there, witnessed all the time he was in prison, and didn't get much results, got a few of them, and finally got in his time and got out after five years, and he had got out of five years, and after he'd been, been in there and got out after five years, he hadn't got home more than a couple of days and got a letter from a cellmate. He'd been with it times, and the cellmate wrote him and said, I just want to have you know something. He said, I got saved when you left the prison. The day you left, and went out the gate, I got saved. And he said, I know you talked to me about my soul before. And he said, I never listened. He said, we were watching you. And he said, you know something? My, my buddies watched you for five years, and you never slipped one time. Amen. Now, wouldn't that rattle your day? Would you think about what you'd done then and thought to yourself, well, suppose I had. You see? God Almighty sent us fear, our spirit to keep us out of trouble. Keep us out of the way. Keep things right. Over there overseas in India, a Hindu employer who hired British people for his, to work with him, and American people sometimes, had a surefire way of getting the right kind of people. 
The one that American said to me, he said, how is it that your staff works so good and you don't have all the trouble these other industrial men have here in India with your employees? They seem to have a lot of trouble with the foreign employees, British and Americans. You don't seem to have a trouble. You have some special way of choosing or setting up standards or requirements for them? He said, yes, we do. He said, what's that? He said, well, he said, when somebody comes here and wants a job from a foreign country and brings their uh, uh, stuff with them and their police and their sacks and everything, he said, we put them up in this hotel overnight. So we put them in there for a week and before we talk to them and deal with them about the job. And he said, in that week, he said, we've got a little slit up there where we wash them in that room. And he said, we always put your Bible right on the table in that room. We watch that fellow, he comes in there. And if in a week he doesn't fool with that Bible or puts it up or doesn't look at it or puts it away, we don't hire him. And he said, if you read that thing, you look at it and study it, we hire him. You don't fool them people, boy. You don't fool them people. I mean, do you do that when you go to a hotel and motel room? Fear. Fear. What for? To keep you from sin. Now, these problems will come to the child of God. You'll have these problems as long as you live. You know the scriptures. The scriptures say, fight the good fight of faith. This fellow surrounded with problems and troubles and disappointments and criticism. And he's taught still, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Years ago, I think it was about 1967, a fellow named Robert Gauche, I guess I'll take to pronounce it, G-A-U-C-H-E, something like that. And he was up in Canada, and he was up there on a, what they call a beaver, of some kind of a plane. I don't know, I wouldn't know a beaver from muskrat when plane come in, but it was a beaver, what's called a beaver. And he got to, he had motor failure and came down in a frozen lake. And he came down that frozen lake, and he's, what, he had a communication system called a SARA. They call it a SARA. I don't know what that is. That's some kind of shortwave something or other. We're staying in contact with the Royal Air Canadian Air Force or something. And he lost contact with the Air Force and couldn't get any help. And in 16 days, his ration gave out. And he drained all the fuel out of his uh, gas tank and lit fires out there and tried to get some help. And a couple of times, plane went by. And pretty soon, they began to miss him after 16 days. They began to send out flights to get him. And Albatross flew over in a DC-7 and didn't get him. And after 16 days, the food gave out, they began to get frostbit. By the way, when they finally rescued him, he had to have five toes amputated. And he got out there and he ate 40 pounds of raw fish the next day, 52 days out there. 30 below zero, 40 below zero. And they missed his flares and couldn't get him. He had a Christian wife at home. And she began to pray. And she prayed and prayed. And they sat out there and flew and flew and flew and covered well, about 25,000 uh, acres there flying around trying to find that fella and couldn't find him and couldn't find him and couldn't find him. Missed the flares. And find the last day they said, decided they looked one more day and then called the search off and give him up. And that day they were supposed to go out at 2.30 and search for 4.30 and something went wrong with the airplane. They got delayed. They couldn't get off the ground at 2.30. Matter of fact, they didn't get off the ground at 4. They were still flying around 6 o'clock at night and heading back home where they came from. And coming back there, one fellow banked his plane down and saw a reflection down there on that lake. And it was the, that old Arctic midnight sun shining down, hitting the wing of that plane. And up there, he'd never rise high enough to reflect off the wing of that plane. And at that minute, at about 6 o'clock, it just happened to hit it. And down they came and got him. Took him back. Five toes amputated and got out alive. Now, what was his wife doing? She was having problems. And she was having difficulties. And she was praying. Now, old boy down there, he had problems. And he had difficulty, and he had sorrow, and he had disappointment. He had pain all in one shot. And God got him out. God got him out. Trouble the Christian. Those things are for our education. The Bible says, bring up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's the nurture. That's the nurture for the child of God. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we pray the Holy Spirit of God might bless the message tonight. And Christian here tonight with problems and disappointments and trials and testings and, and difficulties and, and fear and pain. The other thing you sent their way, be able to handle them and know why they have to handle them. May they learn from them by the grace of God. Lord, I know I've said some things very easy to say from the pulpit. 
And I know put it in practice, these things are very difficult. And I pray the Holy Spirit of God would undertake, and I pray especially for every Christian here tonight that's going through some real test and real time of tribulation and trouble. And I know there's some here that are in such a position. And Lord, the only thing we ask is uh, not to lose a sense of your presence. The only thing we ask is your, your smile. Lord, we can take anything with your smile. We can take nothing with your frown. Nothing. The least thing becomes an irritation or a trouble and an insurmountable problem, an obstacle without your blessing upon it. Now, your blessing is real and your presence is real and the prayers answered, we can get through some way. But not without you, not without you. We confess our weakness tonight and our helplessness in the face of some of these things. And Father, I pray for any unsaved person this building tonight, you'll wake them up and shake them up before they blow up or before it's too late. And they, I step out that inner place where there's no end to the fear, there's no end to the pain, and there's no end to the disappointment, there's no end to the sorrow, there's no end to the suffering, and eternity is just one unsolvable problem. Hell, hellish, damnable. I pray my save tonight, the souls nearest hell tonight, you know where they are. Maybe some of you are going to die in 1994, 1995. And I pray your spirit be them now about this matter of salvation. And let's may the head bowed and eyes closed in prayer a few minutes. In a moment, we're going to sing this hymn by playing. If you're a Christian here tonight and haven't really got down to business with God, I know some of you have. I know you've done your praying. And you've done your homework. I know that. But some of you haven't. Some of you haven't. Some of you still a point of controversy between you and the Lord. In your prayer life, you haven't got to that place yet where you're going to say, okay, no matter what, no matter what, I'm going to do what you want me to do. No matter what, I'm going to follow you. No matter what, I'm going to obey your will. Forward in prayer, some hit the altar already. Maybe others ought to come. But while we're in prayer, I wonder, is anybody here tonight that's never been saved? You never put your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. In that Bible, your eternity is not New Jerusalem. Your eternity is a place where the fire doesn't stop. It's not quenched. And there will be no end to your problems. They're eternal. You're going to the madhouse of the universe. You're going because you trust your righteousness instead of God's righteousness. Would you come tonight by faith and accept Christ your Savior? Would you do that? Right now, while we're tired, just stop it. Step out of your seat and come right now. Anyone in the building? Anybody? If you receive Christ, your Savior, step out and come. Come right now. Anywhere in the building. Whosoever will, let him come. Take the water of life, really. Come on, come on. We can sing. We're going to go sing about two standards. We're going to close. The gospel is clear. Christ died for sinners, rose from the dead. Getting saved won't solve all your problems. Here, it'll sure solve them forever. It'll sure solve them forever. And that in all, Jesus Christ will give you strength and help now that you couldn't get as an unsaved man. Some of you Christians sitting here tonight feel so sorry for yourself for the mess you're in. Did you ever stop thinking what it would be like to be in that mess and then hell on top of that? Like fowls in Pensacola, you could be in the mess you're in tonight, not even be saved. You could be in the mess you're in tonight, not even have a prayer answering God or a Christian friend. God been good to you. All right, let's look this way. What number is that, Miss Clipper? Sixty-nine. Let's start at sixty-nine. The small book. 69, the little paperback book, will stand and sing two stanzas of hymn 69. Is thy heart right with God? 69, the little book. Is thy heart right with God? Wash the crimson floor. All right, 69, let's sing it. Is thy heart right with God? 